Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Monroe Live podcast. Um, for those of you who may be just joined for the first time, Monroe is a company that does uh, lean design, design for manufacturing, um, cost avoidance support to like new product design. And uh, I'm Kevin Hardy. And today we have Dave Tracy. So of all the people that I've talked to here so far, this is the only person that, that I actually kind of know. Um, so you can't blow this one. No, no. hopefully not. So um, you got a friendship on the line. Yeah. So Dave and I met uh, probably six or seven years ago off-roading. Um, he knew of essentially the Monroe Knowledge Center that we, a uh, center that we ran for Chrysler at the time. Uh, he was an engineer at FCA, um, then made the transition. I think you had already done it um, when we met to Jalopnik. And then- you By the way, when we met off-roading, you were, you were driving this enormous- like uh, diesel GM Cuckv, I think you call yes. it. Yes. Yeah. And, and Commercial we utility to, cargo vehicle. Yeah. We, we were trying to get it through the woods. This was a was an off road trail through the woods in northern Michigan, and it was just, it was just spotting. That's all it was. It was barely <laughs> off roading. It was like tree avoidance, is what it was. Yes, and unfortunately, um, I think I you needed tools. That's how we met for your sway bar disconnect, and then, uh, and then we started chatting, and then I pulled you out once, and then I got stuck, and then you pulled me out, and then I slid into a rock on one of the black diamond trails. And I dented the only good rocker panel on that because the driver's side was rusty a little bit. Um, well, yeah, it so, hurt, so. Yeah, well, you got to even up the rocker panels. You know, I mean, one 100%. nice one, but yeah, it was crazy to, to meet you off-roading because I had already hung out at, I knew, obviously I knew who you were because I, I had worked at Chrysler and I was a, you know, fledgling engineer and they would send engineers over to you guys to, to, you know, to benchmark. I remember I was looking at like a Ford Explorer, um, like a power transfer unit or like a rear drive module, something for mm -hmm. their all wheel drive system. And you just have a bunch of, you know, a bunch of parts on racks. And I, I remember actually I got in trouble because you got, yeah, you guys got me in trouble. I rent, I like borrowed a part. It was a, um, I think it was the PTU for an Explorer or something. I borrowed it as an intern. So, and then I left for the summer and I could have sworn I turned it back in. <laughs> well, I leave for the summer. I get hired on full time and they're like, yo, Dave, where, where's that PTU? You borrowed it from, from Monroe. You never gave it back. I was like, I don't know. Anyway, they weren't thrilled with that. Yeah. You? And it wasn't even our part technically. So that's probably why they weren't thrilled with it. So, mm. um, but yeah, so we have some history is, I don't, you want to start by kind of, I mean, you've, you've made kind of. A series of moves, you know, since then, uh, if you want to kind of go to a brief backstory, kind of uh, what's brought to you essentially to LA and, uh, Ooh, and with the Utopia. Like, yeah. So. Yeah. Mm, no one likes that I moved to LA. I don't know. There's just like this. Yeah. So the, for the longest time, I mean, I've loved cars since I was a kid and I always wanted to work at uh, Chrysler because I was a Jeep. I was really into Jeeps. You know, I grew up in an army family. And when we moved to the States, my dad bought a Jeep Grand Cherokee uh, that, the last, the, you know, the first um, generation with solid front and rear axles. And, uh, you know, I have five brothers. So it was six boys in Kansas. We didn't have anything to do. We had a Jeep. So you know what we did. We just sure. offered the crap out of it. The Missouri <laughs> River floodplains right there on Fort Leavenworth. Yeah. Um, and uh, we got stuck like, to, to, we got stuck so often that if we weren't home by like 1030, my mom would know what happened. Like it wasn't, she, it would, she would literally be like, you guys are stuck again. Like the MPs so, are looking for you on range control or, you know, well, the, the <laughs> MPs have actually, they actually had to like come, uh, uh, assist us, not like pull us out or anything, but you're not really supposed to be back there. But anyway, so off-roading with my brothers in Kansas, that really made me fall in love with, with Jeeps. Cause I mean, this grand Cherokee was a tank. You could really beat on it. it had a four liter straight six. You couldn't kill it. So, if you do enough of that and you have enough like joyful moments with a car, it's hard not to fall in love with it. And if you're a kid trying to figure out, hey, what do I do with my life? And you're just like it, just enamored by this machine. Like for me, it was like I got to work a Jeep. I just want to do it. And so I, I'm going to study engineering. Went to college in Virginia. Somehow got lucky enough to get hired into Chrysler as an intern. And then uh, came on full time in the JL program doing cooling system design. Which, by the way, timing couldn't have been better because uh, I didn't want to work on like the compass or whatever. Sure. But like as soon as I got there, I, I, right as I graduated college, 2013, I get to Chrysler and they're like, we're starting the new JL program. I was like, 
you waited for me. It was perfect. <laughs> and then the craziest thing is, is uh, we had a team. Our team was small. It was the advanced aerothermal team. And there were five of us. And the manager of, of our team, uh, Brian Lee's greatest manager ever, he ended up becoming the chief engineer for the JL. He asked the five of us, so we have all these programs people are working on. We've got the the uh, the R R U uh, the minivan. You know we have the DT Ram, we have the KL and the K not whatever. We have all these cars. Who wants what? And I was like looking around. I was like, we're all gonna like jump after the Viper and the Wrangler, right? Like we're all gonna <laughs> fight. We're gonna fight for those two. And everybody else was like, I don't care. I'll just take whatever. It doesn't matter. And it, and it, like that's that's when I realized like. One of the disappointing things about working in the auto industry, like especially if you move to Detroit for the auto industry, you assume that if you work for a car company, everyone there is obsessed into with cars. cars. Yeah, not they have to be. not at all. No. They work for an automaker. <laughs> How could they possibly not be obsessed? It turns out locals need jobs, and it's that simple. <laughs> um, so anyway, I was able to choose. I literally chose the JL Wrangler program, the Viper. I remember I was amped about the Viper. I went down to the, the you know the the guy who had sort of led cooling system design on previous Vipers. I'm like, let's do this new Viper. He's like, oh yeah, uh, the Viper's dead. And I was like, damn. So I didn't get to do anything on that. But I was on the Wrangler program for a couple of years. And then uh, and then I, uh, I got an offer from um, a friend I met in college uh, who happened to run my favorite car website, Jalopnik at, at the time. Uh, and that was Matt Hardigree. He, I had been... I'd, Car journalism for me was like sort of a pipe dream because like, honestly, I don't think you should go to school assuming you're going to get a job in car journalism. There's like three jobs available. It's like, it doesn't make a ton of sense. And I knew that. And I was like, plus I want to work for Jeep. So I'm going to study engineering. It's a good degree to get it's versatile. The journalism thing, maybe I can like freelance every now and then. But I just happened to end up being like basically neighbors with the editor in chief of Jalopnik. And uh, we became friends and, you know, he ultimately asked me to be an intern at Jalopnik during my mm -hmm. senior year. Um, he, he and I met cause I was running a car club and I wanted to like get him on to sure. do like a keynote speech to get interest in the car club. So eventually I was at there at Chrysler. Uh, he hired, he, he, he offered me a job at, by the way, going from engineering to journalism, people think you're insane. Like I remember leaving Chrysler and everybody's like, dude, are you sure about this? Why would you <laughs> literally people were like, why would you do this? Engineering is better than that. Like, engineering here, media here. And I was like, to me, it's like, it seems fun. You get to drive cars, sure. you get to write about cars, you get to interview great people, you get to get interviewed by great people like yourself, Kevin. <laughs> and it's like, it's, um, I thought it was just great. And I was young, I didn't have any obligations. So I was like, let's do it. And um, so I worked at Jalopnik doing like buyer's guides, which is like the worst possible job you could have. <laughs> but on the side, I was wrenching on really cheap cars because I, I just I'm a cheap I'm a cheap bastard, to be honest. So I, I bought a six hundred dollar Jeep Cherokee and I turned, you know, did a whole project and I started and I tore down. I hydro locked one of my Jeeps while off roading mm -hmm. and I tore down that engine and people started to read that. And so the editor in chief of Jalopnik was like, all right, stop doing buyer's guides. Start writing for us. And right. So I did that for a while, and um, and then a couple of years ago, I was like, "All right, I've been at Jalopnik for five, six years. I've, you know, uh, had a great time with it, and now I wanted to start my own site. Sure. So now uh, the Autopian is was born, right? Uh, uh, just about two years ago, uh, this coming April. So that's that's where I, that was way too long of an intro. I really blew no, it. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> what's funny is before we met, I knew where you lived inadvertently because of the pile of jeeps and rochester road um as soon as i once we met you're like oh, i live here i'm like i know exactly where you live literally yes. exactly just, people, i know the exact house uh, people knew live. where i live when i when i wrote for jalopnik so it's like five years and i'm just buying all these cheap cars like a 500 hundred dollar chevy tracker and like a 800 hundred dollar grand wagoneer that i basically dug out of a backyard i'm buying these the reason why i buy these cheap cars one they're cheap and i can afford you know they don't cost anything. I really want to own one and I can't afford a nice one. And I don't have any obligations, no wife, kids, dog, whatever. And most importantly, readers go to you. Like if you write about something and they read it, they're, they're like, they want more. Sure. Next thing you know, you got 14 cars in your backyard, <laughs> which I did. There's a video on YouTube where I jokingly like explain that I'm not a hoarder. Uh, but I, I had 14 cars at one point. 
on Rochester Road in Troy. So if you don't know Michigan, Troy is like not a it's like a nice part of town. Sure. Like it's yeah. I, I lived in an old 1946 like little farmhouse that I was renting. It was the only it was one of two like leftover farmhouses on a street that's basically filled with nice condos and like mansions. Right. And so I had here's this dude who's paying like eight fifty a month for rent has 14 cars, 10 of them in his backyard, one like basically buried. And the neighbor is in like a, you know, almost, a, you know, probably at least half a million dollar house. It was kind of weird, but it was like, a, it stuck out like a sore thumb to the point where like readers would come over because they knew where I lived. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I lived off of Rochester Road close to, uh, um, oh God, was it 60 mile? It... When I moved to Michigan, because uh, I stayed with my friend at this house before I ended up uh, taking over the lease, I couldn't believe that there was a there's exit sixty nine on on Big Beaver, and there's a, there was a Hooters at the corner. I'm like, this can't yes. be real. This, this right literally there. cannot be real. Yep. What, what they, is, they were actually, they were selling T shirts. Yeah, and, it, it was, and you would see exit sixty nine Big Beaver Road. People had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I I, didn't, I couldn't believe it was a real thing. So yeah, I, think, uh, I was I right think, there, not far. So yeah, but but that it's a thing of the past because it um, is because uh, the construction. It's like I don't know exit whatever now. Um, but yeah. So um, anything else do you want to kind of add to you or you know? Way too long of an introduction. We no, can't that's continue. fine. We cannot continue. We can't. Continue. Let's <laughs> so, move on. Um. So I, one of the things that we we hadn't talked in a while and we ran into each other at the auto show um, and kind of had, I would argue, a preliminary conversation about this uh, in some regards. But uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful moment. Yeah. P Hebs, hybrids, BEVs. I mean, mm -hmm. right, right now, and today is, uh, what is it, the 23rd of February? I mean, my news feed is, is all doom and gloom and on my work computer because it's essentially just war in Ukraine, EVs, bad, end of EVs, mistakes, GM, you know, double backing on things, volume yep. cuts. It's just, that's all it is, is like mm -hmm. financial woes and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, and we, we have this conversation here about cost all the time around these vehicles. Um, and I would, and whether or not we, I, I can't speak for everyone here, but there's various opinions on what people like about HEVs, PHEVs, BEVs, the cost about them, complexity about them, manufacturing them, you know, pluses and minuses, um, you know, and things of that nature. So, um, so it's always been a hot topic here and, um, it's become a very, a very hot topic just in general, right? Because yep. we, we've seen impressive movement, you know, I, I've been kind of in the conversations here, been equating it kind of like the star Wars trilogy when, when we saw the Model Y just gaining market share, you know, yeah, it was yeah. like a new hope, right? Um, and then we saw, I think a lot of policies and things put in place. And then I think right now we're at revenge of the market um, where mm -hmm. some of those things do not jive with, you know, reality in many ways. And the market coupled with the, the, the simple fact of the matter is we, we've obviously just got out of a global pandemic. There's a war in Ukraine. And that was four it's, years ago. I, I know it's it's just wild. A war in ago, Ukraine. Yeah. We have yeah. another major war in the Middle East. Um, there's lots of geopolitical positioning between the West and the East, and and just all sorts of things, you know. And and inadvertently, this directly affects you know car manufacturing in many many ways. Um, you know, on the purchasing side of of the house. It's always interesting to see negotiations, where things are going for labor, things like that going into the future and the troubles. And it's kind of like a good indicator. And it's, uh, there's a lot of turmoil there. There's, there's always turmoil, but I think the last, I feel like the last 10 years have just been a tough time for the auto industry in general, um, for all number of things, yeah, uh, but quality, the, performance, safety, But at the EVs, same time, during, there was a time where sales were like booming, like mm -hmm. during the, like right after the pandemic. Like people, like, it seemed like things were great, like there for a minute. It's interesting. So like, let's, let's just start with like, uh, like PHEVs, like you, you, you know, you think they're not good enough here, like within the States. Yeah. So for reference, this is a story that I wrote on the Utopian, which that's our, that's our website. It, it is a car enthusiast focused site. If you love cars, that's like what we do. And every Sunday I write like an opinion piece. And, um, a couple Sundays ago I wrote, uh, 
America's plug-in hybrids are not good enough. And um, it was basically, so I drive a BMW i3 every day. And if you drive that car, you, in my, in my view, at least you realize just how great that like setup is. It is fan. I, I have a 22 kilowatt hour battery and mm-hmm. I drive electric only like 99% of the time. Like you can give someone a car with a battery that's not that big. And obviously, you know, battery supply is an issue and cost is an issue. Right. So if you can get someone driving electric, the like vast majority of the time with a small battery, that's an ideal case. And you can really only do that with a range extended uh, plug-in hybrid. Mm-hmm. Um, but America's plug-in hybrids today are, they're, they're really gas cars first and EV second. Sure. Whereas like the plug-in, like the i3 is an EV first. And if you have to run it on the range extender, you begrudgingly, you do it. But I mean, a lot of the plug-in hybrids today, I mean, the Wrangler is like what? gets like 25 miles of range, something like that. Yep. And that's obviously a brick, but there are a number of like aerodynamic, more aerodynamic cars that are, you know, 30, 31 miles of range. And um, there are a number of issues with that because, you know, some people can commute to work every day, but there are people have concerns about a lot of plug-in hybrid owns just don't plug in. Sure. Like if you're driving on a road trip, like why would you, like, why would you plug in a car to get, 25 miles like let me just stop you know fuel up and plug in to get to, there's no point in doing it but if you've got a car that has like in the case of my i3 70 80 miles of range it, it might be worth it like if you have a reasonable range on a on a, a plug-in hybrid i think it's like between 50 to you know 120 something something like that that's your range and then you've got a little gas engine you're gonna focus on driving electric there's there, there's incentive to do it um and you don't have to have a huge battery you could still drive electric most of the time and i think just as important you know it's not necessarily just about the numbers it's not just about okay well if, if you do that the emissions are going to be this and the cost a lot of it's like getting people into a bev is in, like some people are just still skeptical about sure. it. sure like there's a skepticism that wouldn't necessarily exist if you said look you still got a gas engine in this thing you could get someone who is extremely skeptical towards EVs driving electric 99% of the time if you would offer them a car like this, which Ram is doing, by the way, with their new Ram um, charger. Uh, Ram charger, which, by <laughs> the way, what do you think about that new Ram charger? It's interesting. It it seems like the epitome of like excess. You know, it's a huge battery with a Pentastar a big generator. Engine. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Uh, well, it's, is it it's, a huge? The thing is, you're right. It's a huge battery, but it's also less than like it's like half of the size of the fully electric. See, the problem is, if you want to tow, you have to have 200 kilowatt hours of battery. Sure, and that's a and that's like a it's a weird you know realization. You know, many CEOs have kind of spoken to it. The that there's and honestly, frankly, I'm I'm tired of like even reading anything or people talking about towing with EVs like. Years ago, people knew that it wouldn't be great, and nothing has nothing has changed drastically with respect to that. Um, you know, and you know, to go back to my Star Wars analogy, when Return of the Jedi happens, I don't know when that is, right? But I, I do, ultimately, it comes down to to essentially battery cost per kilowatt hour, right? To to get these things down, and that obviously will only benefit not only Bevs, because um, I think EVs, regardless, even if carbon emissions were never part of it, in some ways makes sense from just like an engineering standpoint yeah an engineering standpoint yeah. like a, a life standpoint like it's kind of nice you can just plug them in they're awesome there's, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of benefits to them so i think even yeah. if there was never if if you know and maybe we'll get there with the porsche you know e-fuel if if it was just hopes and dreams and, and butterflies that ice cars burned i think eventually we would still trend that way just because of the integration of electronics into everybody's life you know uh we're probably not too far out from just you know, electronic implants and it just being cyberpunk with respect to the human body. So it makes sense that we would trend this way with automobiles just in general. I do agree. I think it would eventually be EV just by the very nature of how they drive. They, they, if I have a gas car in my garage and so I do, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a Lex, there's a gas car and then there's the I3. If I grab a, a set of keys without 
just like really making a, a an actual decision. If I just instinctively grab a set of keys, it will be the i3 every time. And that's just because in my brain, I know it's just quiet. It just feels, you're not starting an engine. There's like a comfort. It just feels right. It is, there's just not as much going on. It just, it's, it's a, it's a better driving experience. So, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously I'm a huge ICE fan. I love a stick shift and all that sure. as well, but like you can't drive an EV and, and not realize this, something about this feels like just right from an engineering standpoint, you know? Yeah. I, I think they have, a, like I said, I, I think we would have gotten there anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, for, for, for lots of reasons. Um, I just think that the biggest issue that's facing everyone now is there's a lot of market factors there, you know, that's driving cost up, even though we just had like a, a pretty big plunge in lithium price, you know, recently. So even all of our numbers that we have now, if we were to, we probably would want to rerun some, uh, in the future, but it's, it's interesting. And there's, in the background, there's, there's tons of capacity coming online. So for, for better or worse, you know, there was this, this push that there's a, a singular solution. Uh, at least in the automotive space from a carbon emission and it's, it's battery electric vehicles, right? So in the background, there's, there's tons of plants coming aligned and domestically abroad, pretty much everywhere. Um, significant, you know, investigation on, you know, minerals and, and things of that nature, because even if it wasn't cars, it would be something else, right? Cell phones, other, other electronic devices, nothing is, is using less energy, um, and even less battery capacity. So, uh, but as far as, you know, the, the, the PHEV aspect, you know, I don't, I don't know if you want to kind of talk about like park complexity or, or, or things of that nature, yes. but there, it's, it's interesting to me, like, you know, Monroe I don't know your opinion. Tell me, I feel, I feel like you, you, you have an opinion, but like, what do you think about PHEV? Like, just tell us what you're really sure. Thinking. So, I um, mean, obviously I'm one person here, but there's a, a group of us that feels that, that PHEV probably got skipped over. Like initially I was very much like too much complexity. Um, especially when some of the PHEVs that we tore down very early on, you know, uh, Alexis LC, LC 500, which was painful because they don't make many of those cars. And, uh, um, oh, yeah. and it was kind of like, those are cool. They're, they're very neat. They're very, very cool. Uh, and very, very well put together. The interior, like nothing moved, like very high quality fasteners everywhere. It was a disaster from that perspective because they didn't have the, they didn't heat stake anything, which is, which is commonplace because they just didn't invest. It's like essentially built by hand, right? They just had a guy running in with a nut runner for I mean, door a, panels. As a customer, no heat stakes for me, that's a deal breaker. Yeah. <laughs> First thing I look for. Yeah. Yeah. And who can fix it? Right. But, uh, it was, it was kind of a shame to tear apart and you can tell anybody that, uh, came down that was, you know, JDM fans were just like, this is, that's this pretty is, cool though. This that's is, cool this is wrong. You, you should not be doing <laughs> Any other Toyota product or Lexus product, not this one. But um, there's a lot to be learned from it. The customer that was interested in it, you know, for some of the other stuff. So, but it was, you know, modules, you could, you could tell, right? It was um, supplier based, you know, OBC charger, just modules picked together, yeah. placed wherever you could fit them. Because obviously the other powertrain was a V8, yeah. right? Um, and when you see that, you, you couldn't help but think of just the the problem sets from both powertrains, right? Oh, valve to, you know, valve issues, oil changes, everything that can go wrong in an, an ice car can go wrong Plus, in this one and yeah. everything that can go wrong in an EV. And I think part of the problem is, you know, maybe when the whole industry shifted very, very hard to EVs, I think even in the background and, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff coming from these new PHEVs that are just kind of like around the corner with significantly more integration, you know, inverters, onto transmissions with the P2 motor and stuff like that. So things that have been consolidated to get away from essentially this kind of piecemeal approach. Um, but we, I do think they make a lot of sense, especially if with limited capacity, right? We, we've talked a, a little bit about it. There is lots of capacity expanding, but in the world, especially in the North American, you know, car market, um, the realities of, of emissions and there's some, you know, there's many that would argue that emission standards kind of got us into this predicament with the size of vehicles and the class of vehicles and test weight classes and things of that nature. But the reality is we're here. And then for every mile per gallon that you could get better on an F-150 or Silverado or Ram or their SUV counterparts are pretty big in terms of total, you know, carbon emissions. Um, so I think it, there's a lot to be said and, you know, Toyota can, has kind of been on their own little soapbox for a long time about this, that they, they didn't feel that it made a lot of logistics sense to have like a 200 or 150 
or 130 kilowatt pack stuck into one BEV when you could essentially hybridize um, three cars for that more than, you know, See, that's if the, you're that's, talking, if you're talking Hummer, yeah. you know, level packs, 200 kilowatt packs, um, or even like the Rivian, right. You know, yeah. Well, it's 10, just, 10 vehicles. Right. And, and not, you said you're just, well, roughly the, you know, the, the same capacity that you have in your I3. So not insignificant, um, right. electric cap, uh, electric capability. The, the downside to them is if, you know, if we were to go through and start like grouping cost, mm -hmm. right. As you go through, you know, there's still a big delta between PHEV and BEV, but when you kind of look through it, it, it's, it's right where you expect it to be. Frankly. What is that delta? So, so if we, it, so it, it, I, I have some numbers that I smashed together, which are like oh, an amalgamation, yeah. right? So they're high level and I, they're kind of, I don't want to say they're purposely misleading, but, um, and also because of the lithium stuff, the prices have changed, but I think it's, it's probably safe to say between the range of like five depends, right? We'll say roughly a, um, like a 15 to 20 kilowatt PHEV to like maybe an 80 kilowatt BEV. Let's just stick with like six to $9,000, right? Like Delta between the two. But if you were to go through the majority of it, it's the battery. Because once you're in the PHEV, and now it, it's even more to like an ICE vehicle because essentially you have your, you know, OBC charger. So that's a line item. Poof. And it doesn't get that much more expensive for BEV in comparison to a PHEV. There is obviously capacity when you're depending on, you know, what what type of system you have, um, but you you have it when you go there, right? And then if you were to go down, then the next line item, you, and in general, you kind of have like your, your big engine systems bucket for an ICE. So alternator, your whole 12 volt system. Yep. Alternator water pump, sometimes on these PHAVs, it makes sense for them to be electric, you know, this, but there's this whole plethora of essentially support systems for an ICE engine, fuel, fuel tank, uh, uh, carbon canister, things of that nature's, which is like kind of another big bucket, 1500 ish plus dollars, depending on what you're looking at or size. I mean, you've it's got just, transmission at this point. Right. Too. And, I mean, and that doesn't even exist like on the, on the BEV itself, you know, High voltage lines are probably roughly comparable. They, they get more, right? You know, especially if you're running like an all-wheel drive setup where you have high voltage going from front all the way to the rear. The, the yeah, now the, you got one on your compressor. Vehicle. Well, actually, you'd have to have an electric compressor anyway on a P on a PHEV, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, why would you not? Um, yeah. When you kind of get through that, so when you make the plunge into PHEV, you're really not close, but you you've gotten into an, a series of major cost drivers. Mm -hmm. of a BEV, which is the downside of a, of a PHEV, right? Because then you also have the major cost driver of, of like an ICE vehicle. So let's say for like, like this imaginary vehicle, we'll say it's like a midsize, you know, truck PHEV, right? Doesn't mm -hmm. really exist yet. Um, towards like an imaginary midsize, well, not really, there's a Rivian, but like not that type of capability, you know, kind of scaled back. Um, but you're talking probably somewhere in the realm of today's price is like four thousand plus dollars for like let's say a direct injected v6 dual overhead cam you know motor right probably comparable price another big line item probably another four plus thousand dollars if we were to do like tip of the spear like highly integrated let's say eight speed six speed eight speed transmission p big maybe 100 120 kilowatt motor um in the trans integrated, you know, kind of the next on the cusp, if you will, um, you know, transmission, then you have transfer case. So there's, there's things there that you kind of go through, but there's, there's interesting aspects where you're starting to break up separate line items, um, you know, that the, the ICE vehicle has, uh, which is, you know, expensive, like probably 1100, 1100 bucks, let's say for a nice advanced, like uh four wheel drive auto transfer case, then you're probably 500 bucks or so for front axle. IFS, I mean, honestly, you know, but you could ditch all that if you just, if you had a range extender, right? You just, you're just using it as a generator. It I guess it depends on your, your, I'm assuming like a, if we're midsize truck longitudinally oriented, you know, and if you could, like, if you were to essentially partition this out and do a front wheel drive based vehicle, you know, and just have electric power to the rear, you can essentially start omitting aspects of this. Mm -hmm. But I sent, I guess there, in short, there's, there's no getting around the high voltage battery pack cost. Yep. And that's the the biggest driver. And, you know, we're kind of talking like functional systems as you kind of go across and then, you know, the Teslas are not like uncompatible or uncompetitive in terms of weight, but some of these vehicles get extremely heavy 
very quick. And then unfortunately, weight begets weight in terms of cost, yeah, right? right? So totally. if I need to, if I'm trying to perform well in all regulatory requirements and third party requirements like IIHS, those, you know, sometimes do not jive well for cost and efficiency of like a vehicle, um, just based off of where your body structure monuments want to be and how you want to support everything that gets a person to move around versus protecting a person off of a barrier impact or a particular style of impact. And like the heavier it gets, the more weight you have to add or more creative you need to get in terms of cost or materials to protect the occupants. So that's kind of the downside when you start either for PHEVs or BEVs adding weight. Um, and I think if we talk about, you know, off-roading and, and EVs, I think there's a, an interesting thing that I've been noticing on that side as well, right? From traction perspective, especially yep, when it gets slippery, yep. uh, I just tons of Rivians and, and early images of cyber trucks, just lots of things sliding and low traction yep. considerations where that would not, you'd never see that with a, like a nope. Suzuki Samurai, right? It would just plow through because it's light. And, uh, there's, there's something to be said for just your overall mass. But so in short, I know I kind of said a lot, I think there's a lot of merit to PHEBs, especially like a well-integrated one. I think that's the biggest thing is not everyone's there yet. Um, I'm not sure even where some of these, these, these companies are with respect to them because you're kind of seeing people double back and recant on on statements with respect to where they're going for future powertrains um but I, I think it makes sense for a lot of people given kind of just the current environment and the cost of batteries um, I, I, I like I, I love bevs and obviously most of your listeners and viewers are huge obviously yeah. full electric not a lot of them not huge PHEV fans I get it that's totally fine but the thing is, I don't think it's necessarily about it, – it, it's not necessarily solely about uh, you know, the emissions of a BEV versus the emissions of a PHEV. There are some realities that sort of uh, uh, go beyond those numbers. And those sure. realities are uh, 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 supply, battery supply, and just human beings' uh, skepticism towards – making that plunge, which is a reality. I mean, sure. there are people for whom rational or not, right? Uh, I think, it, you know, most usually ir irrational, but there are a lot of people for whom a PHEV is a more palatable option. And if you can get that person driving essentially electric every day versus them continuing to drive their truck, there's value in that. I'm not saying it's rational, but humans are irrational actors. Sure. So on that front alone, uh, PHEVs make a ton of sense. Add in uh, supply limitations uh, for battery materials, and, and, and it makes a, a lot of sense. It, it, you add in cost concerns, and and then you know these become especially um, significant factors when you're talking about people who like want to tow a boat, um, it, it, and and you know they now can drive around in a 90 kilowatt hour Ram with a range extender up front right. instead of a 200 plus kilowatt hour, which by the way. They would be carrying around usually probably 120 kilowatt hours of battery that they do not use. Probably 95% of their driving, probably just carrying around just tons of weight and money and uh, you know materials. It's like anyway, you know, it's it's um it's a tricky thing, but I think um I think it's going to need to be a blend, and I think people are coming around to that. Yeah, I mean, it's just sometimes you just can't escape, right? And I, like I said, revenge of the market, I think. I, you know, and one thing that was really, I was just in Canada very recently, and I thought something was very interesting. Like, there's a lot of solar, um, and we weren't that far kind of in like the London uh, um, area. Um, a lot of windmills, and I was doing some cold weather training with the Canadian uh, Army. And one thing I thought was very interesting is, on their post, they had a motor pool and every stall of this particular motor pool had EV chargers. And there oh, was cool. not, uh, um, not one EV was there that I saw. Granted, they could have been out driving around. It was nothing but Mercedes, Army, G-Wagons, Ford Power Strokes, and things of that nature, right? And I thought it was kind of interesting to me um, where we have, I think, not supported I think the auto industry well, right, with respect to this. We are holding them to this standard with in terms of emissions and things of that nature, but we haven't done, I think, enough as a company. If we're going to do that as a country, um, we haven't done enough on the infrastructure side. I just thought it was very interesting to me that I'm looking at this parking lot. It's There's all this charging capability right there, 
None of it was being used. It was almost the inverse of what I would say we have here in some regards. Wow. Um, and then when you talk, we, I got a chance to talk to some of them, just the cold weather is a fighting in cold weather is a completely different ball game, right? Um, you have a lot of diesel vehicles down here. Then they start transitioning to gas vehicles as they go farther north. And then it's just like, yeah, you're on foot and you just, it's, I mean, they, they have snowmobiles and things of that nature, but it's a, it's a whole separate ball game. And you know, one of the, the with the officers in this course from the Canadian, he had a model three and I asked him, he's like, it's great. It's fine. It's, we don't live that far North where it's really a major issue. Um, as most Canadians actually look pretty close to, you know, the U S border. border. Yeah. But, um, he's like, but it's everything when you start getting cold. And obviously I think that's kind of what started a lot of this. Um, at least on the, the media craze was that cold snap. And then it just kind of cascaded from there with respect to range, range drop. performance, yeah. things happening and, and infrastructure. Right. Um, By the way, so, None of that was like new information. It was just, yeah. It, yeah, it, it was a little silly. I, I also, I, all right, we have a couple of other topics that we, that I sort of would, uh, that, that I sort of mentioned that would be, I would love to talk about. Sure. But before I get to that, there's one thing that I've noticed as a car journalist working with automakers and driving their cars and interviewing their engineers. And um, I think they're, on some level, there's just going to have to be a reality, uh, an understanding among automakers that Tesla is an anomaly in some ways. You can't necessarily replicate what Tesla has done. Mm -hmm. You can't come out with an SUV. Like a lot of automakers, hey, let's just come out with an electric SUV. It'll sell like crazy. Look at the Model Y is selling like crazy. It doesn't work that way. Um, I just drove the new Fisker Ocean, which I, believe it or not, uh, you may have seen that a lot of people had an issue. I actually kind of, I kind of dig it. <laughs> I actually think it's special. It looks cool. It's fun to drive. The thing about it is you can't just come out with a, a compelling electric SUV and expect it to do what a te Tesla Model Y does. Or same thing with a sedan and a Model S. Tesla is a – first off, they were first to the – I mean, they were, they were first. That's part of it. Second, they're larger than life. They are like the brand is bolstered by this person who is larger than life. Sure. And it's like if you're a brand and you think you can replicate based on Tesla's numbers, that is not going to happen. Like it, it, and I think like a lot of these stories about, oh, EV sales are not what they were expected to be or whatever. It's like I don't know. I just – there needs to be a reality that on some level Tesla is Tesla. Yeah, I mean, they're, and I, I think, you know, we, we, we've talked to a lot of OEMs, uh, for anyone that's heard me say this again, I apologize, but like, you know, and they, they want to know, right, about the giga castings and, and some things that, that Tesla does and where's, where's the difference, right? And what, what can they do to emulate them in, in a positive sense, right? Um, and I think the simple fact of the matter is, one thing that's really interesting is, like, think of your, your time at FCA, right? How FCA is organized and just the sheer number of platforms that they have. And then look at Tesla, right? It's essentially like two and a half ish now three with the cyber truck, yep. right? Model S. And I wouldn't say they're, they're very similar. They're, they're not model S model X model three model Y. There are people, you know, people that you and I knew, right. That were responsible for twice that amount of vehicles oh, yeah, totally. by themselves. So there's a, there's a whole organizational structure thing that I think that, um, you know, people don't, give, I think, big auto enough credit for because they're essentially managing things at scale that Tesla still doesn't, right? As far as like portfolios and, and they also care in some ways about things that Tesla doesn't care about, right? Like they don't care if you get the same, they didn't even care like the model Y with the, the gig castings. Maybe you got a 48, uh, 4860 pack with gig castings. Maybe you didn't, no one knew the fact that we got one, like we had a lot of our customers come to us in some ways only because we had one, right? Because they had bought two or three Teslas from oh, Austin wow. and they didn't have a giga casting. So that's wild where, I mean, think of like um, some big change on like a Rubicon, right? Where they're like, that can't happen as a running change. Well, we would never, they'd never stand for it that I, my Rubicon had this amount of content and yours had something different from a whole slew of reasons, right? Um, yeah. Just from your order guide alone, right? But they, they don't care. Yeah. They don't care. And a lot of the people that like their stuff, they, they look at it more as software as it's updated and they just see it's like, yeah, it's continual progress. That's kind of what we expected. You know, I like that. 
I like that side of what Tesla does, that sort of continual chain. You know who really who does that like at a level that I don't even think Tesla does is Chinese automakers. I don't have a I don't have a good sense, even though we have one sitting here. Um, but that that is a that is an interesting question, right? In general. Uh, I'd love to hear your take on on anything from the, the China EV perspective. So I drove some in Germany. Uh, or a funky cat. I drove a Maxxis, uh, like a um, minivan MPV. I drove an Iways U6. And I spoke with some of their uh, representatives there in Germany. And uh, there was kind of like a braggy nature uh, 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 towards the conversation. It was like, it, it, I was like, so we were talking about competing with established automakers there in Germany. One of the representatives for one of the Chinese car companies said, oh yeah, they, they can't compete with us. This is, they're not even our competition. They're like, they're not even competitive. We're, the only competitors are the other Chinese automakers. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And one of them showed me um, a rear wiper on, on their car. They're like, see that rear wiper right there? Um, we came out with our car. Some customers said, hey, why doesn't this car have a rear wiper? And like within six months, it was, it was part of the, you know, within less than six months, we had a rear wiper like you could buy it. Like it was now part of the car. They're like, we make changes so fast. And I don't know if you know, I pulled that out of my behind, but sure. but they're like we we make changes so so quickly, like that doesn't happen uh, with Western automakers, and and um, and so yeah, now things and things are getting really weird in Europe uh, with with Chinese automakers. It's like okay, honestly, the whole story of the Chinese automakers and Western car companies it's kind of a fascinating story because. You probably remember like 10 years ago, all the automakers like, yo, we're making so much bread in China. It's ridiculous. It's the biggest freaking market. We're just cha-ching. The cash register is just clicking. Gold coins, bills everywhere. And well, part of that was like, hey, if you want to sell cars here, you have to be part of a joint venture. Yes. And which is kind of freaking genius. I mean, if we're being real. And now, and I'm not saying that China didn't know how to build cars before Western automakers started building cars there. They do now. <laughs> but they, but I am saying is they know how to build cars after all of those joint ventures from mm -hmm. those automakers who were talking about how much bread they were making in China. And uh, now those automakers in China are going to the home of the Western automakers, Volkswagen going straight to Germany, competing, out-competing in some ways, those very automakers – it's a crazy, it's kind of insane in some ways. Yeah, I think it's, in many ways, I think we've, we have a series of layers of insulation from I think the problem that, that Europe has with, with Chinese EVs. Um, but it, the whole thing is wild. Like even, you know, at, at over various, like the last five years or so, you know, we have a slew of different customers, some who build in China, some who want to build in China. And, and if you talk to them, like, I think the biggest issue is, and maybe this might be coming home to roost for them, is the cost difference, right? Everything is subsidized um, significantly in China. There's, there's no, like you're saying, it was all partnerships. And I think a lot of people, if they, if they didn't realize, if you're going to China and you get, yeah, yeah, sure, you're getting like amazing labor rates, machine rates, and things of that nature. And sometimes, you know, like the best that the world has to offer inside if, as far as like, you know, capability um, at, at prices that you just, you'll never find anywhere else to include even like, you know, Mexico, which some people have hailed in the past as like the next great low cost, you know, bastion, if you will, uh, for the automotive industry. It's, and the numbers, none of them make any sense. Like there's, when you look at some of the, like an identical part that's made in Mexico or here or other places in the world compared to the, that same part in China, it, it's like, and you would know because you literally do that for a living. Yeah, it's unfeasible sometimes, <laughs> right? Um, and you're, you're, there's always like different commercial things that happen, you know, that may affect um, material piece. I don't, I don't want to say material piece price, but piece price. Um, so there's always commercial side of things or negotiations are always a little weird. Um, but there's, there's that factor, and it to me it's almost like the Tesla factor. When when people talk about it, I'm like, yeah, they can iterate. And, but when it comes to value, they're like worth as much as 
the rest of the industry together, right? So when it comes to like, if they want to make a decision about tooling or not tooling, they're like, how much money does it save us? Well, it theoretically could save us this or like, I want three parallel efforts to investigate it. And as they fall off, just and then consolidate those efforts and, and go forward and find me the, the right one, right? Um, there's, and not, not every company can do that. They don't have that type of money, you know, to leverage or, or whatever it is. So it's, it's very interesting to see, but that for us, I, I don't, I think the only thing is we've, we've done some things for better, for worse on like the protectionist side, as far as EV incentives. And, and some people in the media have sort of decried those uh, efforts saying, you know, cheap electric cars from, from China get more people driving electric. And so that's a good thing. Yeah. I think, uh, I think it, you know, it's a, the problem with this conversation, like unfortunately most conversations nowadays, there's a lot of nuance and it's and real it's easy. It gets political fast. Um, so moving on. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but it, oh, I lost my train of thought, but uh, when you, when you, let's see, EVs. Oh yeah. Uh, the, getting cheap EVs in the U S get more people. More yeah. Well, well, one of the big things is like our safety regulations here just like I have a, uh, a friend who does, um, used to work a, uh, for Volkswagen and when they would go, you know, to Deutschland and, and talk about the U S market, they hated our market. They hated the warranty claims. They hated the safety stuff. Like there's the emissions. Um, you know, there's so many things because essentially we were a, ju just like China was to a lot of the domestic automate, this huge market that if you don't play in, you might be losing in, in many, many ways. Right. Yeah. But we, all of our requirements are, are very stringent from emissions and, and safety, right? Um, you know, bringing cars from the JDM market here, 25 yeah. years, and then you bring them over and even bringing them over is an issue. There's a whole K car thing, which is funny because they are small and relatively efficient, but, um, kind of death traps and, and whatnot. So, but there's that aspect, which is very interesting. So we've kind of, we do have that layer of protection aside from what we are offering in terms of like, um, tax incentives crash and, and, and things of that nature. So not that they can't do it. Uh, they, they can, it's just one more hurdle, you know, to get through, because when you try to build a, a global vehicle, it gets a little difficult if you're trying to have a global architecture to meet all the different, all different needs of various markets. And the U S market is pretty stringent. And we, I, I, I don't want to say it's like peak, uh, like automotive experience here, but, um, like the epitome of first world problems exist here. People complain about a lot of things here, right? So if, if their vehicles aren't just the way they need to be, there's a lot of issues on the warranty side where I think in, in other countries, they don't, it's just, they bought it as long as it works, it's okay. You know, oh, so yeah. it's a tough market, no doubt. It's a tough market. And so from that perspective, like, can you launch and put a windshield wiper on a vehicle in six months? Yeah. Could anyone do it? I think so. Would other, would, would the big three do it? Or I mean, it's two because it's really Chrysler is now huge with Stellantis, but, um, probably not because of the risk. Yeah. They'd want to want a, a full durability and, and, oh, full and tell me, on. right. From your perspective, right. I want to make an airbox change. You, you want to, you want to change an airbox. You tell me how long it takes. There's no, if you're going to make a running change, you forget know, forget about it. That has so many implications on exactly. everything. Exactly. So forget it. And, and that is there. And I think that's why Tesla moves fast because they may or may not have the, the legacy. I want to say pitfalls like or knowledge, right? Yeah. They, they don't have the issue, whatever that was like our wiring gauge at this length in the harness will be this and supported X amount of times. Well, why do we have these design requirements? Well, you know, in 1980, this happened. Yes. And it'll, you know it'll never happen again. And yes, totally. So I, I remember at Chrysler, we having those conversations with say, so that this CS routing thing that we do, you know, the route, the sort of routing requirements, what are those, you ask the people who are implementing them, you know, who are, you know, doing the CAD and placing wires and all that. They're like, I don't know. It's just, it's just the process. You know, we just follow it. It's just been there forever. And it's like, well, yeah. <laughs> it's like a weird oh, culture. Man. You have no idea why, but that's why we do it. Right. And, mm -hmm. and some of that is, you know, I, I think why they're struggling, um, because there's, there's whole layers of that domestically, I guess, you know, with, with EVs of cost, right? Just some of these things burden you down the line and you, you, you get in this area where you, you have, you struggle with cost avoidance and you're, you're designed into this area where you have requirements that either put you on an Island and that, that may have been very, very purpose, right? Like trail rated or, you know, right. there's, there's marketing slogans built around this, like a rock built for tough, whatever it is, there's, there's things that have 
actual requirements behind them because for these vehicles, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's why they exist, but it may be why they are so successful and at least people kind of hang their hat on it and they, they won't challenge those requirements, um, where you have someone that comes in and, you know, you know, we know for a fact that for some of our customers, like Tesla's don't meet their internal requirements. But does it mean it's a bad vehicle? Hmm. Of course, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't work that way. And it's vice versa, right? Their main competitor in a segment may not pass their requirements. You have to always challenge your internal requirements. What always challenge them? Like, does the customer care? And 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 like, that's something that I remember those conversations at Chrysler, sit down around the tables and we'd be trying to design to some standard. And, you know, some senior manager might might say, okay, but does the customer care here? Because if not, we should reconsider this standard. And it's like you're dealing with thousands of standards that you have to maybe reevaluate. It's like pretty wild. Sure. Yeah, and and I don't know. So I think to your your point about the the Chinese EVs, I think a lot of companies here could do it. Uh, I think they won't because of the risk, both from a recall perspective, which that's the other thing that in my newsfeed, it's like war, EVs bad. And someone has recalled another 150,000 to yep. million vehicles for some yeah. reason. It's just mm-hmm. nonstop, right? Because I think just in general, the, the industry is struggling. Um, but By the way, those Chinese vehicles that I drove were incredible. Like the ones that I drove in, um, and I also drove an MG. Um, they were, I mean, the technology was great. They were like monitoring my state, whether I was, you know, dr- drowsy. The interiors were, I mean, some other American cars do that too, but like sure. the interiors were loud, like blue, white, red in there. They were like, they weren't just boring cars that happened to be electric. They were like going for it, you know? Um, they, they were special cars. Like they were legitimately cool. Well, I think Kia's done that well, Kia Hyundai, right? That's true. Like That's they true. pulled a lot of designers from Audi and things of that nature. They have like the kind of the, the things that make Toyotas like desirable, right? There's nothing fancy about a Kia Telluride. It is an all steel body, steel subframe, steel control arms, naturally aspirated V6, I think a six speed transmission, nothing, nothing fancy at all. And then where you can touch things in the interior, it's nice. And then from a style perspective, it's very handsome. Obviously styling is subjective, but I think it's a good looking vehicle and it's affordable and people like it. Does it go through the Rubicon trail? No. You know, does it do a lot of these other things? No. You know, is the, it depends on what type of like how you're evaluating it. Does it do things as well as a Grand Cherokee or a Ford Explorer? No. See, this is the thing that I always, you know, as a car journalist, uh, people always ask me for car advice. The one thing that has been true, that is irrefutable. Automobile purchases are irrational. And if you try to if you try to rationalize them, you're just going to go crazy. People buy into a, a a sort of vibe, like like what is this car? How does it make? How does it represent me? How sure. does it make me feel? It's styling, it's marketing, it's some of its performance, but a lot of that is like, hey, I read this review on Motor Trend, and that this car outperformed everything. It's the best. Some of its performance, which is a co- sort of a rational thing. But a lot of it is just totally irrational. Mm-hmm. It's, at, it's at the point now where if someone asks me for advice, like, hey, I really like this car. I'm like, if you really like that car, you're probably going to ignore what I say <laughs> you should buy and buy it anyway. So just buy that car. Yeah, it's it's tough. I, and I think you probably saw it there. A lot of our customers and a lot of the engineers there in some ways. And it's hard not to do it. You design vehicles for yourself. You, you know the ins and outs of them. You know what you kind of like, what you'd like to see. Um, you know, and many reviews, I've heard senior managers talk about it and like the Toyota RAV4 is all the car you need. And we never can deal with that fact. We, we over content and we struggle with recalls and we struggle with this. And do we offer more to our customer in every like metric possible? Yes. But sometimes all they care about is something that starts, drives and goes 300,000 miles. And yeah. it, it may be irrational, like, and, and I would say the the value oftentimes the value stream associated with Toyotas is maybe a little irrational because they're they're <laughs> yeah. I, I have a love hate relationship with them. I think that like in some ways they're amazing, but I think for your dollar amount you don't get a ton of car in comparison to other things. But you and do it's not, not usually the most advanced. Either, yeah, yeah, but it's arguable that you you get a relatively trouble free existence with them. Everyone has problems; they have their own issues. But um, yeah, and I will say to the listener, if you want to hear 
if you want to read about uh, a five hundred dollar uh, Toyota Sienna minivan that I purchased and drove across the country, it was trouble free. It was fantastic. So that one definitely lived up to the hype. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, also, speaking of uh, things that uh, we wrote, we've written about recently. I was wondering if you saw that story by Hubert about the Tesla Model S's steering rack. Yes. Um, I think sourced so, by Land Rover. Yeah. So yeah. Hubert, Hubert Mies writes for us. He designed, developed, was head of suspension design for the Model S. And he was, and he talked about a, a salute. Basically they were trying to find a steering rack. Turns out steering racks are expensive to, to, to tool up. So they were like, we have to find something on the market that will work with our suspension design. And they found a Land Rover Evoque right-hand drive steering rack. They inverted it and they built special brackets for it. So the Tesla Model S steering rack is an inverted Land Rover Evoque steering rack, right. right-hand drive. And I was wondering if you've seen, I'm sure in your role, have you seen clever cross-brand like use of parts? Maybe that's unconventional. Uh, I think it's, it's, it is unconventional, but not in the space I think that you're kind of talking about, right? So, um, that's their second vehicle. The first one being the Roadster, which was a Lotus that was been, you know, repurposed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's very common to see with vehicles like that, like your, your Fiskars and things, because well, they're expensive. There's no getting around it. Right. You know, yeah. uh, Rivian knows this very well, right? Like building vehicles is very expensive. Um, so it's, I think it's no different than kit cars, you know, factory five stuff. It's like a 95 Mustang steering rack with, a, you know, steering totally. knuckles from this pulled from this there's because it's those just funny to, it's just funny to think of tesla as that kind of company but it was you know in what 2010 or whatever yep so I, I think it's very common to see that um and then you'll see obviously just joint ventures and and f or lasting like past arrangements um you know it's it's funny when you see you know certain british vehicles you go through them and you're like well oh, famoco right and it's years after oh, the part yeah. right and you're like all right and or under one heat shield you go in there and there's a, a ford part number right so um it, it i would say it it's pretty much an indication of the the maturity of your company and, and your product I, I think ideally you want to control as much as you can um but because of the cost to on the capital side you you buy buying stuff like that is, is well suited. You're going to pay for a little bit in the piece price or maybe not. Right. Um, you know, some of these, you know, volume is a, is a tricky thing, you know, in the, in the industry. Um, maybe you can talk to some people and, you know, maybe Land Rover was like, they wanted to scale back capacity and then they were going to get charged money because the supplier is like, you told us that you were going to build 200,000 of these over this amount of time. And we're going to charge you cancellation costs. So now they may be, you know, would love someone said like, Hey, we'd like to buy a steering rack. You're like, absolutely. How much, what, how many do you want? We'll give you 50,000 of them a year. No problem for this price. Cause they don't want to pay, you know, I'm not saying this happens a lot, but the, the reality of the industry is, you know, commercial agreements get people into, you know, they're, they're legally binding. You're going to build X amount for this amount of time. You provide them to me at every, this timing iteration. If you don't, then I have to shut a plant down. We're gonna yeah, have right. we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a conversation if I have to shut a plant down yep. over a lack of parts, right? So, or if I have to slow production down on my most profitable vehicle or popular one at this time, and uh, you know I'm not hitting whatever X amount of jobs an hour, there's a, there's a conversation there. So um, that whole thing is is weird, um, but not uncommon. I think it's just an indication of the state of a vehicle. Yeah, I I just I I thought it was uh, clever that they or different. Like you, using a common part, normal. Taking a right-hand drive rack and then turning it upside down to make it work for yours. I mean, I think it's I think it's pretty great. Sure, I mean it's pretty great. Um, okay, one thing we're gonna we're gonna talk about off-roading EVs. Sure. Uh, if we have we'll have to be very brief here, but um, so I'm I'm planning on starting an EV conversion of a World War II Jeep using Nissan Leaf parts, which is going to be a nightmare. But uh, that I'm going to keep. The entire drivetrain, the transfer case, okay, um, just a full drivetrain, um, and it, it makes me think about. Um, and the plan is to try to take it through the Rubicon Trail. This is going to be a multi-year adventure, I bet. Um, the it makes me think about having off-roaded a number of EVs that have come out, like the the Rivian R one T, and then seeing recent Cybertruck off-road videos, um, 
and the way that they behave, it, it seems a little bit different than what I am used to as sure. an off road as an uh, avid off roader. So like the R one T was interesting because it's a four motor EV. Uh, so you're 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 go say you're going over a, a rocky trail, and one tire loses loses traction. You know, there's certain amount of juice going to that motor. Um, and so it, it has to pretty much quickly, it has to quickly react. Um, and, and to try to emulate a locker with these four motors, I don't know. It, I don't know if it's that challenging or what, but Rivian wasn't able to do it when I drove the truck. It was a lot of the tires were flaring up. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you would lose traction and it would flare, it'd speed up really fast. And then eventually they'd pull it. Which is not good. You don't sure. want you don't want your your, your you know, high tangential velocities on your tires when you're off roading. That can throw rocks all over the place. Could help make you lose control. There is like this control associated with a fully locked four wheel drive system where basically the tangential velocity of your tire is more or less the speed of the vehicle. Sure. Um, and so that like when driving the R1T, I noticed man, that's something that they can't quite get exactly dialed in like a mechanically locked system and then you know you saw the recent cyber truck off-road videos where it was sort of sort of spinning up a tire and not trying to you're trying to get up this rock and i just wanted to know your thoughts as a fellow off-roader and a, you know an ev expert well ev expert um <laughs> the term <laughs> expert just gets you know uh well yeah well i, I know i know word, we just joked about word, it here People way, like, you guys are I, experts in this you um, know what i when i was like a one year at Chrysler, I was there for like less than a year and I was handling the, the MGU, like the, the, the motor generator yep. unit for the jail. I remember a company email going to our supplier. I think it was Continental. Uh, our company's two MGU experts, David and Zeph. I was like, holy shit. No, 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 no. <laughs> I cannot believe they think I am the expert on MGU for the company. I've been here for like nine months. Sure. Anyway. Well, if there's no one else that knows more than I know, that is it. the definition of expertise. Hundred percent. <laughs> um, so, uh, EVs and off-roading. So, I think anything performance and vehicles starts with tires, right? Um, you know, we have there's like a, a fight here at Monroe. There's like Team BF Goodwrench KO2s and Team Goodyear Duratrack. Uh, oh, uh, same year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. There's, there's no question person? in my mind. So, um, if they want to pay for my tires, it'd be great. Cause I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I have literally 116,000 miles on my tires uh, right now. And I'm still at like 730 seconds of tread. I'm going to push it for another year, I think. How is uh, that even possible? Uh, I do five tire rotations. So I rotate the spare in, like your standard Jeep uh, tire rotation, every oil change. So I'm pretty diligent about it. Um, and I think they're good. They're expensive, right? But I'm a, a dirt track guy for sure. I wish I had some of the data. Uh, our friend, John, our mutual friend, John had data that Chrysler had on it. And he's like, they're expensive. That's why we didn't go with them on a lot of vehicles, but they're, they're good tires. Um, especially for trucks. And when you see to me, when you look out in the Pacific Northwest, I see a lot of dirt tracks, like in when it gets a lot of, it's like tough country and there's weather. It's a good tire for everything. everything. The only thing it doesn't yeah. do well is they're noisy. They take weight and they're expensive, but yeah. um, it's a good thing that you, you said that last thing was starting to sound like a commercial. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, I mean, there's you, there's you down... quickly brought in. They're noisy, you know. They're you know all sorts. Of, they got problems. Um, but if, if you need if you got thirty fives, you don't want send them my way. But um, I, and I think that's one of the first things there is, is tires, especially because yeah. these vehicles are so range like obsessed. That well, they... yeah, but they're they're so powerful. <laughs> yeah, like, right. and yeah. like, you know, my, the cuck fee, right. The first thing that thing made 150 horsepower, maybe 280, foot power, maybe, I don't even know what a naturally aspirated six, two diesel is. It had 308 gears in it. It didn't want to move anywhere. And it was oh. the best thing off road. It made just enough torque to just keep itself moving. It never upset itself at it a, it a mechanical locker and good tires. So it went everywhere. Um, that's great. And I, that got me out of essentially manual off roading. Um, but I think it's tires is the first thing, uh, first and foremost. And then I just think there's no getting around the weight and contact patch aspect. So that the tire, the, the, the style and size of the tire yeah. and the weight, and then the conditions, they seem to do very well, you know, in, in your normal, like, you know, um, like slick rock and stuff like that. They have 
if as long as they have traction, they're fine. But I think unfortunately the weight and if they lose traction very quick, things seem to me to go si literally sideways with them very, very quickly. So, yeah. um, it just, I've never seen, it's almost like landslides that happen where you have the, um, just everything kind of leave with the vehicle and they just kind of skid down hills. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, I've had it happen to me, but not in the same circumstances. So that's the only thing I find very interesting about off-roading. And I, I have zero, to be frank, off-road EV experience. Um, I didn't get to go with the Rivian or anything like that, but, um, that's just what I've noticed. And a lot of the videos that I have watched, um, with them. So, yeah, I have a friend who, who does like, you know, off-road EV development stuff. And I don't think people re realize how complicated it is, you know, compared to a, an ICE car where it, it's just mechanically connected. You yep. know, it's like pretty straightforward. Like you were saying, like a, you got a rear locker and you've got enough, you know, force at the contact patch, you know, via gearing, like you have enough low end torque and crawl ratio and you have a locker it's going to be smooth. Like your right. off-road experience is going to be smooth. And it obviously starts with tires. If you have bad tires, you'll be sliding all over the place. Um, with, you know, with the Rivian, I think some of that was tires, no question, you know, huge wheels, you know, like, you know, um, but then part of it is just like, once you lose traction, if you're locked up mechanically connected, it's not a big deal. Like with an ICE with lockers, okay, you lost grip. Your vehicle doesn't even know, like doesn't really even care. It's still going nice and slowly. You'll eventually gradually get up the obstacle. With the Rivian, it was like, we lost grip. Oh, we're spinning up so fast. Oh, we got to stop it. Spin this one up. Oh, it's just, there's so much going on. It's, it's all, you know, it's all logic, you know, in sure. and, and a controller. It, it's all got to be coded in. And it's, it, it's just, it's a little more complicated, you know, when you've got, independent like in your drive trains are independent and it's like it's tricky yeah i don't think like you know if you had a lightning right that's sync you know just a dual motor setup single dual motor, motor. yep and it's got a locker in the rear right so well, it's fine and that's, it, that, that's honestly that'll probably be good enough and like side side you know locker. um yeah I, it just it is interesting the um, everything about off-roading and evs is is interesting because you're 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 really you're talking about a use case of a it's like humans being in space. It doesn't want, it doesn't really want to be there because you're so far away from the charging infrastructure. And it's, <laughs> That's it's, <a> good point. <laughs> it's difficult to kind of carry that with you. Um, but I, I, you know, I have watched this guy that, um, they leveled and threw like essentially Raptor takeoffs on a lightning and they had some interesting experiences. Like obviously it lost range, no surprise. Um, but in the mountains, it was like, relatively range neutral it was getting cold and they were losing capacity overnight but they were able to do a lot of regen you know while while kind of essentially bebopping around the trails um up and down low the speed. mountains and evs like low speed i'm very i'm i'm curious about like the off-road effects on range because a lot of people assume when you're off-roading the range is going to be terrible but i'm like eh, how different is it than city driving yeah i don't have a lot of i just don't have a lot of time anymore to follow it but it was something i i keenly was paying attention to because uh I was kind of hoping that like there would be an, an e expedition shortly after the lightning for the wife, you know, but, yeah. um, but it's, it's interesting because that's the, the whole use case, right? Just everything about it is a little bit different, especially because the single highest dollar value item of your vehicle is also the, the most exposed, um, for some of these yeah, situations. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> and I think you, you won't have that with your willies, right? If it's just, uh, you'll have weight higher in the vehicle than your average yeah. EV will, but yeah. So, um, I want to respect your time. So we're, we've gone a little over, um, <laughs> is there anything else you wanted to kind of, you know, add, kind of speak to, um, uh, no, just that, um, it's always wonderful talking with you, yeah. Kevin, um, and, and with Monroe, I've, uh, I've been hanging out with Monroe folks for like a decade now yeah. at this point. And, uh, one of the, you know, honestly, some of my career, I kind of owe to Monroe in a roundabout way because um, when I first got to Jalopnik, uh, so when I started my journalism career, I remember thinking about Monroe and I was like, what a fascinating company that was to the average person. Like once you're in the engineering world, you see cool things and you're just like, that's just is what it is. And you, you sort of don't realize how cool they are. But I, for some reason, remember I became a journalist and one of the, probably like really one of the first things that came to my mind when it came to like cool things that I can teach someone who hasn't been in the auto industry was yo Monroe, they, the benchmarking other automakers, 
look like looking at like the tiniest parts, like really tearing it, tearing them down. It's not only is it like visually fascinating, which ended up helping my article, of course, but like what you do, the costing, like truly understanding cars in, uh, at a level that really no one else does. That was a story that was so well read back. I think it was in maybe early 2016. People were like, holy crap, this this exists. This is cr- look at all these parts on the on these racks. Yeah, I remember people thought like it wasn't legal. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, everybody does it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, whole be- fleet of competitive vehicles. Totally. Yeah, but yeah, people so. like people didn't even understand the, the, that element of the auto industry. No. It wasn't really talked about. Um, but like, yeah, vehicle benchmarking is huge, and like that really got a lot of people thinking. Oh, you could just tear someone's car down and copy it. Like, of course, everyone does that, and it's um. And anyway, so I, I, you know, obviously, thanks a lot for, you know, taking the time and talking with me today and just for uh, you guys just doing cool shit. Well, uh, thank you. And for a long time, when people had asked what you do, I would just send them your article. And a lot oh. of people here, some people are like, oh, I finally understand what we do because someone wrote about it. <laughs> what? Someone someone at the office? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. 100%. Jim. He's like, yeah, it's the easiest way to describe it, you know? So, um, I mean, like, I'm not even joking because it's what we've done over the years has has changed, right? We've we kind of ebb and flow with the times when and your media now actually that's the thing the last like you know what four four or five years like yeah really has become a big part of what you got and you guys are doing great well, and then, you know what yeah. i think you know what i think your media the explosion it it gives me hope in this world because it literally is okay someone knows something that i don't know they're actual experts i ha- i'm going to follow them it's literally Obviously, it's your personalities and it's the way you do, you know, you execute your media as well. But a lot of it's just nobody else does this or knows this. And I want to learn. And like, that's kind of great. It's not just like little seven second TikTok videos of like cats. Again, uh, I, I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we'll do this soon. It, this was a lot of fun. And it was nice talking at the auto show and then the, the stampede event later. You know, we didn't even like listen to it. You know, all the Ford brass is there just chatting about stuff. And we were just talking about, you know, Bev's and whatever and, and just where the industry's going um so we'll have to do this again soon and hopefully yeah. report. it was it was fun and um, yeah, thank you so much kevin i appreciate it yeah thanks so um yeah i guess uh till next time so thanks again dave i appreciate it yep thank you